Tom said, my name is Jake Lopez. I'm the executive director of Safe STEMIC here in San Antonio. We're a local nonprofit. Uh, we uh, work with lower socioeconomic areas, uh, those types of school districts, those type of uh, students. Uh, predominantly, that's where our focus is. Uh, what we do is we have several different programs. Um, we go out to the schools a lot of times. Is this okay? This feels very informal. Sorry, uh, uh, we go out to the schools and work with students that don't have these opportunities. Uh, for example, my kids are very privileged, very blessed. I can take them to the Museum downtown, or I can take them to the Woody and get them some hands-on experiences. Where a lot of kids, primarily in this part of town, don't have those opportunities, uh, just whether it be financial means, or a lot of times these students, when they come home, they are mom and dad to their uh, younger brothers and sisters. Uh, so I'll go over a few of the programs that we offer. Uh, but first, uh, I just want to go over our mission. Uh, I'm not going to read that out to you, just basically what we like to do is we try to connect uh, K-12 uh, schools and academia with uh, higher education facilities or uh, campuses as well as industry, government. What our goal is in the next five years is to have a pathway, what we call from cradle to career. We want to generate a, pop a pipeline so that when students are learning content in their classes, they already know what career they want to go into uh, rather than try to figure it out, which is what I did, and I'll get into that later. Uh, what we value, if you notice, uh, what we value here is collaborating. We try not to do everything on our own. We value with, uh, we collaborate with other uh, companies here in the area. We collaborate with uh, universities as well as K-12 uh, institutes. Uh, and if you see what's highlighted, we, uh, we value the students that we serve and their families. As we said, we feel that all students have the same opportunity or should at least have access to the same opportunity. And that's what we try to provide. Uh, I'm just going to go very briefly over the topics that we offer. Uh, one of the ones that we do is robotics. Uh, students learn how to program a robot to complete a specific task or function. A second one that we offer is video game design. Um, it's very basic, but it gives them game programming skills. And at the end, what the students do is they uh, trade their games with the other students to, I guess, to critique, to, excuse me, to critique so they can see what was good about it and what could be improved upon it. Uh, so that's a uh, one of the more popular ones. 3D printing, that's another very cool one that students like. Now, uh, we would not have enough time to actually 3D print all these projects. It would take about three or four weeks to do that. But we give the students the uh, programming code and skills that they could use and transfer to their 3D printer, 3D printer at their campus. Uh, computer programming, that's basically coding. Again, giving them basic skills. Uh, a lot of these uh, jobs that we're preparing students for don't even exist. I mean, if you think about it, app developer. 15 years ago, that job did not exist, and those guys are making almost $100,000 a year now, uh, punching keys on the keyboard. I wish I knew, I, I wish I knew about that back then. <laughs> uh, another one that we offer is hardware engineering. Uh, we use our Arduino sandbox, and the students do uh, basic components of hands-on working in teams, uh, working together to uh, build a computer. And uh, what we're venturing into now is green technology, so uh, renewable energy is what some <coughs> students work on. Uh, what we do is they're building windmills and they're trying to light up a circuit. And we're coming up with some new ones that are not uh, really developed yet, but we're working on solar energy, maglevs, and uh, well, I think that's it for now. So anyway, those are the six topics that we offer. Uh, we offer these topics in a maker camp uh, this spring break. We're actually working with Saha, San Antonio Housing Authority. We're going to lower socioeconomic uh, housing areas. One of them is out here, as a matter of fact. Another one is out there off of the Walsham area and then one kind of the linear high school area. And we're working with those students uh, to keep them engaged so they don't get lost during spring break. And they're going to select these uh, topics that I just chose or that I just spoke about. Uh, the, they want, their community wants their youth to continually to, to be involved and be aware of careers that are out there uh, that they may not be aware of. In addition, we also offer all those topics in teacher professional development. So we can come out to your campus, work with the teachers, and show you how to implement this into your classroom. Uh, do know that this is not an entire curriculum, meaning that it's going to be a, a complete semester's worth of content or a year's worth. It's only going to be about a, a week's worth of content, more supplemental. So typically teachers would implement this at the end of each semester. And what we do is we have the teachers, as you can see from this picture, they take the role of the student so they understand what type of pitfalls that the students would run into and what types of questions would come from their students. That way they can uh, know how to address that when they implement it. Uh, our premier program is known uh, as the Geek Bus. That's our mobile makerspace. We take this uh, bus out to the schools 
Uh, if you think about it, if a, if a school was to take their students out to us, they would have to pay for substitutes. That's a big chunk of money there. They have to transportation, more money. They have to pay for meals. I don't know how much that adds up, but that's more than it would cost for us to go out to them. So basically, we're bringing the field trip to the school, allowing the students to have uh, this hands-on workshop, allowing them to get experience and exposed to what types of careers are out here in the technical field. Now, if you notice this, this is also part of our Geek Bus program. There's a, a session that's in, our, uh, in the classroom. Each of these sessions are two and a half hours long. What we don't want is, uh, you know, we don't want them to run all, all the students in there at 20 minutes of time. Uh, reason being, you know, we'd say, hey, how was, how was your day? It was cool. I got to see a 3D printer working. What would you learn? I don't know, but I got to get out of class. That was cool. That's not our goal. Our goal is really to get them hands on <coughs> basic foundations of what they would actually be doing in this career. So for that reason, these are two and a half hour sessions. That's kind of a drawback, but we want them to be fundamentally sound and make sure that we give them enough information for them to say that, yes, this is cool. This is something that I want to do. Or the flip side, we want to give them enough information to say, this is not what I want to do when I get older. Um, I know many people that went to school for four years. They get out of the career, they're there for a year, and you say, man, this is not what I thought it was going to be. That's five years that they just wasted. So if we can provide the students information to make a choice one way or the other, uh, we're trying to do that. In addition, if you look at all of these students, everything is done collaboratively and in a group, whether in pairs or small groups. That's done intentionally. Reason being, uh, before I worked for say, STEMIC, I used to uh, implement STEM programs all around the country, and constantly work with industry that sponsor a lot of these programs. They always said, hey, we've got great programmers, but you know what? They can't work in a team environment. They're not coachable. They can't follow directions. Give me those type of people, and I can teach them how to program. So for that reason, we've done a lot of uh, group and collaborative uh, curriculum. And so that's, that's done intentionally. Uh, a side effect that we've noticed, which wasn't intentional, is that a lot of ELL students when they're in the traditional class setting, they tend not to raise their hand and ask a question. Why? Embarrassed of their accent or just not fluent in English. But in this setting, they don't have that problem asking their partner, and it's helping them improve their English. Again, that wasn't intended, but it's been a byproduct that we've heard uh, from other teachers. So uh, that's, another, that's another plus, I think. Here are some uh, stats uh, that we had. This is our 2016 numbers. Uh, in 2016, we had over 15,000 students that we served in the area. We went to over 90 schools and centers, and then we had 36 outreach events. Okay, so that could be a conference, uh, that could be a community event that they held. Uh, and what we're really proud of is, if you look at our economically disadvantaged, uh, we serve 83% of those students. Okay, so again, we try to focus on Title I. That does not mean that if you're not a Title I school, that we're going to say no, we will not turn anybody down, but that's where our focus is. Uh, male and female participation. Uh, 49, uh, 51, 51 is the female, and we're trying to get that increase. For some reason, uh, numbers show that uh, males tend to dominate the STEM area out in the career, and my research from several years ago actually goes all the way back down to elementary school. Elementary teachers here? No? Well, what my research showed was that um, elementary teachers tend to be focused on ELA, reading, not really on the sciences and the math. And when they, they can't translate that math or the science to their students, and sometimes a female will say, well, what about me? How can, it, how can I learn? And the teacher may not be good at it and say, hey, I, I made this far. You'll be okay. Not to say that's true for everybody. That's just what uh, tends to be a generality, else I'd say. Now, if you look at our uh, pyramid there, 55% of our students are in elementary that we've served. Uh, we've seen a switch in that. 35% in middle school and 10% in high school. Our numbers actually used to be the other way around. Uh, but what, what's happened is that uh, when students get to 8th grade, all of you are familiar with uh, HB5, where they choose their uh, designation when they go into high school, is that correct? Yeah. A lot of them are not choosing the STEM designation. They're tending to choose um, public service, um, public safety, and medical careers. Why? They know exactly what that is. They see STEM, and they get scared. They think they need to build something that can go to Mars. When actually it's stuff that they're doing right now today. So that's what we're trying to emphasize. So our niche leg has been grades four through seven. So by the time they get to eighth grade, they already have a better understanding of what STEM is, and they can uh, choose that STEM designation if need. Any questions on this? Uh, here's just our contact information. If you want to get our full impact report uh, with all of the programs, you know I mentioned uh, teacher professional development, um, outreach, uh, summer camps. Um, 
Those numbers that I showed were just for our Geek Bus program. If you add everything in, it was closer to 25,000 uh, community members that we were able to serve the students throughout uh, last year. Uh, and then Tasha wanted to say, or wanted me to talk about how I got into STEM. So I don't know that it's, it's probably pretty boring, but I guess I'll give you about five minutes of it. Uh, so I started out um, as an Algebra one, Algebra two teacher way back when in the 1900s, so it's, uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> Um, and I was doing a lot of project-based learning, so we were doing hands-on, and we were showing uh, students, you know, I was, uh, we were launching rockets, uh, finding uh, right triangles, uh, doing quadratic equations outside of the classroom. And uh, that's when a lot of testing came in, and it really, really hindered what you could do in project-based learning. Uh, so I just thought I could do some more uh, good going to administration. I went to administration, and it was really a top-down effect, you know, testing and, and standards and results and whatnot. Uh, so I went out to the uh, writing curriculum for uh, several companies. Um, then I came along, uh, has anybody heard of Pisco Education yeah, out of Kansas? So I ran their STEM programs for several years, uh, and that's where I talk about uh, implementing programs all over the nation. So I've, I've got a lot of experience with STEM, I've got a lot of experience with working with industry and being able to tie uh, modules that are, uh, or curricula that's tied to an industry into the classroom and so that when a student comes out of the classroom, they may not necessarily have a certificate, but at least a good understanding of what they're getting into should they go into that field. Um, now, my, well, my dad, he's from Mexico. And when he came here, he said, you know, that I had to go to school. That's what he said, I had to go to school. I didn't care what I graduated in, but I had to go to school. Well, uh, actually, we first grew up right here off of Weir. I don't know if any of you are from here, but I live right down the road on Weir when I grew up. And then... Uh, moved to another area off MLK and W.W. White is where I really grew up. And school was not a very big thing over there. So like a lot of kids that you may interact with, don't have those types of role models. So I knew I had to go to school because that's what my dad said. Well, I played football, so I said, well, I'll be a football coach. To be a football coach in Texas, you have to be a teacher. Well, I was pretty good at math. I went to calculus in high school, so I said, well, I'll be a math teacher. But had I known I could be an engineer, or had I been exposed to these types of programs back then, I probably would have chosen something else because I would have, back then all I knew was that my math was on the textbook and I had to pass a test. I'm a real good test taker. But if I'd known I could apply into a different career or job, I would have done something else now that I look back at it. But I wasn't, I wasn't given those opportunities. Those opportunities didn't exist back then. So what we're trying to do now is afford those opportunities to all the students in this area because we have a very tech-savvy uh, community that is here. Just a lot of people don't know about it. Everybody thinks it's in Austin. Well, there's a lot here. I mean, we've had Data Point here. Um, the Wright brothers were here way back when with the partner with the Air Force. I mean, there's a lot of uh, technical history that's happened here. We just, we don't toot our own horn. So for that reason, I, I hope I'm not rambling. We want to get that uh, information out there and let students know that they don't have to necessarily do what their mom or dad did. There are other careers that are engaging in what they like to do. Like there are tech careers that we may be preparing for that don't even exist yet. So uh, again, if you want to see our full impact report, you can go to one of those websites uh, that breaks down the 25,000 community members that uh, we were able to touch last year. And we're hoping to touch more than that this year. And uh, I guess I'll for questions once everybody's done. All right, thank you. Thank you.